Good evening. Uh, before we start, I'd like to remind everyone in, <clears throat> in attendance that if you can please sign in, there's a sign-in sheet at the back of the room. That way we have a log of who all was here. Um, I would like to call the Tuesday, October 23rd, 2018 Planning Commission to order. Uh, if you would all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> We'll start with roll call on my right. Simmons Lee here. <clears throat> Garden Hire here. Roberts here. McNear here. Brady here. Bowden here. Austin here. Uh, quorum is present. Consent agenda. All matters listed within the consent agenda have been distributed to each member of the Planning Commission for study. These items are considered to be routine and will be enacted upon by one motion with no separate discussion. If separate discussion is desired on an item from either the Planning Commission or from the floor, that item may be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda. Are there any items that any members of the Commission would like removed from the consent agenda? Any items any members from the floor would like removed? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion uh, to approve the consent agenda. So so, second. I have a motion by McNear and a second by Bowden to approve the consent agenda. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Regular agenda item number one. Uh, Enterprise Leasing Company of Kansas, CUP-18-01. Hold a public hearing and consider a conditional use permit for an auto rental business to be located at 915 East Lincoln Lane. We have a staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Michelle Cricks, planner at the City of Gardner. And this evening I'll be presenting um, item C or item one, a CU, or conditional use permit re request for Enterprise Leasing Company of Kansas. Uh, this evening, the applicant is requesting approval of a conditional use permit um, within, the, within the New Century Plaza development. The proposed use is classified as outdoor sales heavy use, defined in the Gardner Land Development Code as a retail use where the primary business is associated with large scale development and merchandise that can only be displayed permanently and year round out of doors. The Land Development Code provides examples of this use, such as sales or rental of motor vehicles, large equipment, boats, or recreational vehicles. The applicant is proposing to occupy approximately 1,500 square feet of a multi-tenant building for a car leasing business serving the Gardner community. The closest car leasing business is located in New Century Air Center for another, by another provider. The applicant is proposing to use this space for leasing operations and for the parking lot and the parking lot for the storage for the uh, car fleet. No on-site vehicle washing or detailing will be conducted and those matters will be taken care of off-site. The applicant anticipates daily car rentals will range from 10 to 15 uh, per day. Hours of operation are 7.30 a.m. to 6 o'clock p.m. Monday through Friday and 9 to noon on Saturday and they plan to be closed Sundays and after our key drop will be provided. The applicant um, is not proposing any changes to the approved site, ban, site plan or building elevations. This application is before you this evening to approve the outdoor sales heavy use in the C2 zoning district required by the Land Development Code. So just kind of a quick aerial of our uh, general location, the site, um, is outlined in blue. Um, some of you who are on the Planning Commission 2017, this might look familiar. Um, you can see with the site that this, uh, you can see part of the shell of the building under construction. And the general location of this is just south of Lincoln Lane and east of Moonlight. Um, before you here is the um, approved final development plan that was approved in 2017 for a 6,825 square foot multi-tenant building on, on uh, 1.2 acres in New Zealand. 
Plaza. Currently, the shell of the building is in the final stages of construction. Um, and urgent care is being finished in one of those tenant spaces. And um, the uh, approved final development plan and landscapes um, is uh, what is before you this evening and was provided in your uh, staff report. Uh, this is uh, the approved north elevation of the building. Uh, the applicant is proposing to occupy the far left space um, on your screen. So this is the elevation that faces Lincoln Lane. Uh, here is the um, product of the uh, construction of that shell building. Uh, this is taken from the entrance from Lincoln Lane. And here is the uh, shell of the building uh, taken from the internal drive just south of this uh, lot. And just a quick kind of reminder of what the utility is showing that there's um, multiple utilities around the site and everything is necessary for this applicant to conduct their business. Uh, earlier this year, the city adopted the Gardner uh, Main Street Corridor Plan and incorporated that plan into the 2014 City of Gardner Comprehensive Plan by reference. This site, which is circled um, in blue on the graphic, is included in that study area of the Main Street Corridor Plan and has been identified as community mixed use on the future land use map. The future land use map included um, in the Main Street Corridor Plan supersedes the future land use map in the comprehensive plan on those parcels within the study area. A 2018 amendment to the comprehensive plan describes the community mixed use future land use as part, in part as intended to provide retail and professional services for the everyday needs of the people res, uh, residing or working in the community. Um, and it is staff's opinion that the proposed car leasing service use is consistent with the future land use description in the comprehensive plan. Now what was um, a big item for discussion and something that staff really had to take a look at was the um, on-site parking. And as part of the applicant's business model, a substantial amount of parking um, of the parking spaces on the site will be needed to store cars. Um, the site was originally approved for 73 parking spaces and out of the 73 approved parking spaces on that site, the applicant is proposing to occupy 41 of those spaces. Staff analyzed the needs of the applicant versus the needs of the other uh, current tenants in the building and determined um, uh, that the remainder of the parking um, is sufficient. The applicant and the property owner have worked together and agreed on a plan for the site to ensure adequate parking is provided close to the other tenants, which was attached in the staff report. Staff finding, staff finds that the uh, proposed uh, use complies with the Gardner Land Development Code, uh, that the use complies with the City of uh, Gardner Comprehensive Plan, and the applicant has complied with the specific use standards for the outdoor sales heavy use in the C2 zoning district. Staff is recommending the Planning Commission recommend um, <coughs> approval of the application um, CUP 1801, a request for a conditional use permit for Enterprise Leasing Company of Kansas, LLC, located at 915 East Lincoln Lane, a staff report dated October 23, 2018, and a site plan dated September 27, 2018 to the governing body. And the recommended motion is in front of you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. This is a public hearing item, so we will now open the public hearing. If anyone would like to comment on this item, please come forward and state your name and address for the public record. Individuals are allotted three minutes, and an individual representing a group is allotted seven minutes. Uh, if we have the applicant present, yes. it's a great time for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Todd Parker. I work for Enterprise Runner Car. I'm the facility and construction manager. Um, we're excited for the opportunity to be in Gardner. We currently service Gardner from our Olathe location off of I-35 and Santa Fe, um, and we currently service New Century Airport, Signature, um, this allows us the opportunity to serve your customers much quicker uh, in the local community than taking them all the way back to Olathe, Kansas, which can be a 30-minute you know, round, round trip by the time they get done. So uh, that's really all the comments that I have, but I just said we're, you know, we're excited to, to have the opportunity to be here in Gardner. So. All right. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? 
Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. A motion by Commissioner McNear with a second by Commissioner Brady to close the public hearing. Uh, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Planning Commission discussion. Uh, anybody have any comments, questions, discussion items? All right. I don't have any. Thanks. Believe it or not, I have nothing as well. <laughs> uh, I have no questions. I, w I do like that the parking and number of spaces was studied because that worried me at first until I read everything. So thanks for the due diligence and diligence of figuring that out. So thank you. Nothing here. Uh, Mr. Parker, hope this happens. It's a great addition for our city. If you're not already, we hope you get involved with our Chamber of Commerce and be a, a vital member of our community. Thank you. I don't have any. The only question I had was whether we needed to associate a time frame timeline or is it just indefinite? The Land Development Code does not um, stipulate any time frames on the conditional use permits. Double checking a time frame in the code. run into this issue before what what the code says at 17.03.050 is that approval shall be valid for two years and the governing body may grant a one-year extension um, that in the position then that that language is similar to other codes um, in the position that other uh, planning departments have taken is that that is the minimum that's allowed and that you can grant um, you can grant further periods of time than are required or then are provided by that because it doesn't say um, th that they're restricted to a two-year approval so that's that's just interpretation that's been taken by others I, I would suggest that you have discretion um, to grant for a period of time for longer than two years
So do we need to define a time period or do we just let it roll? Yeah. But my recommendation is that, um, and what, what I have seen uh, tied with this is that you, you tie the conditional use permit to the applicant and the use in question so that, um, you know, if someone else comes in down the road enterprise uh, vacates you've got a new user in there they'd have to come back through to the extent that their use um, would somehow be at variance with what enterprise did okay so can i can i get a clarification then when it says that a conditional use permit for enterprise leasing company of kansas llc located at 915 east lincoln lane doesn't that cover our bases Because it's tied yeah, specifically to enterprise. I mean that it, it could be interpreted that way. I, I guess I would make more explicit stipulations, <laughs> stating that um, the conditional use is tied to uh, the user enterprise and enterprise leasing company of Kansas LLC, and that um, it's it's tied to uh, well and at the location that that's noted. I mean I guess so, that kind of gets there. So if we were to change the word for in front of enterprise leasing to say solely to enterprise leasing company, would that make it legally palatable sure. for you? Okay. Did everyone catch that? So for in front of enterprise leasing should be solely to. Do we need to tie a, a timeline to that or? What, what we're saying is that if you're tying it to that user in that location, when he closes or leaves, then the CPU goes away. Okay. Conditional use goes away. I'll tell you this is not an uncommon issue, um, particularly with codes that have a strict hard uh, timeline on the front end. Um, that that they will or that have that two year duration. Some of them are one year at the at the at, for the very first granting. That a period of time longer than the first initial term is granted, particularly in light of the capital investment that the applicant will make in in the uh, location. They simply wouldn't do it if all they were guaranteed was a one year or a two year investment return. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Any additional discussion questions? If not, I'd entertain a motion on this item. I'd like, I'd like to make a motion that after review of application CUB 18 01, a request for a conditional use permit solely to Enterprise Leasing Company of Kansas LLC located at 915 East Lincoln Lane. A staff report dated October 23rd, 2018, and a site plan dated September 27th, 2018. The Planning Commission recommends the governing body approve the conditional use permit application. Second. I have, uh, sorry, I have a motion by Commissioner Garden Hire with a second by Commissioner Bowden that after review of application CUP-18-01, a request for conditional use permit solely to Enterprise Leasing Company of Kansas, LLC, located at 915 East Lincoln Lane, a staff report dated October 23, 2018, and a site plan dated September 27, 2018, the Planning Commission recommends the governing body approve the conditional use permit application. Any additional discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Regular agenda item number two, Mid America Bank. FDP-18-07, consider a final development plan for a bank to be located at 18365 Gardner Road. Do I have staff presentation, please? 
Good evening, Commissioners. Michelle Leiniger, Principal Planner. Um, item two is for Mid America Bank, proposed to be located um, just south and east of uh, West 183rd Street and Center Street, um, just south of Casey's. This is some visuals of what it looks like from the site to the surrounding area. Um, this is from the site to the north. This is Casey's. Um, there is a vacant lot that would be between the bank and the Casey site. This is looking west. Um, there's residential across uh, South Center Street from this site. This is looking east. Um, basically at the site and then beyond that is um, a sliver of property and then more residential. And then looking south, this is the um, retention pond for the development. Here is an overall site plan for the site. Um, just some things to note here. Um, it is uh, located with Gardner Road or Center Street, sorry, Center Street there until just a little south um, on the west and then a private drive along the south and east of the um, property. Um, the site provides trash enclosure, um, a drive-through for the bank, um, parking in the front and on the north, and pedestrian access from um, the existing trail uh, to the front of the building. Um, there are three uh, curb cuts into the property from the private drive. There are none onto, directly onto uh, South Center Street. Um, the very first one off of South Center Street is an exit only. And then the next one is an entrance only. And then um, the one at the northeast corner of the property is a full access. Um, something to note is that at the um, northwest corner of the property, there is a future connection. Um, the preliminary development plan for this uh, development shows an access road that connects the private drive across this bank property, across the property to the north, and then onto the Casey's property. The Casey's property is stubbed for this access drive to be completed. Um, one thing we're missing here is a cross access easement will need to be um, provided so that we have that accessibility across the fronts of those properties. Here is the um, landscaping plan. It's very busy, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details. Um, there's street trees along the private drive and uh, South Center Street. Um, there is uh, some buffer yard requirements on the west side of the property from the residential, so that is also shown here. Um, some staff findings. The site is capable of accommodating the building's proposed use, access, and other site design elements required by the code will not negatively impact the function and design of the right-of-way or adjacent property. Design and arrangement of buildings and open spaces consistent with good planning, landscaping design, and site design principles and practices. The overall design is compatible to the context considering the location relationship of other buildings, open spaces, natural features, or other site design elements. The architecture and building design uses, uses quality materials and the style is appropriate for the context considering the proportion, massing, and scale of different elements of the building. Um, as stated in the staff report, the materials of the building play off of the, um, both the Casey's and the post office building. You'll see little bits of um, that in this building. Um, the proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plan. The final development plan is in substantial compliance with the approved preliminary development plan. Um, this is discussed further in the staff report. Um, this is a, a change from what is identified on the preliminary development plan, um, and a copy of that is in, also included with your packet. Um, in the 
approved preliminary development plan, it shows a bank with a drive through on the middle lot and then more of a strip center on, on the um, southern lot. Um, the change is less intensive. Um, there's less building coverage by making this change. Um, there's less uh, parking coverage. There's actually more green space with this. Um, so it doesn't trigger that substantial change to have to uh, revise a preliminary. Um, and then again, the cross access easement needed to um, for across the property. Um, the applicant has requested three deviations. Um, the Planning Commission has the authority in the code to deviate from street types, open and civic space types, applicable uses and performance standards, building type and frontage types, site plan design and landscape, parking quantity and design, and signs. These deviations are well within your authority. Um, this is a little different than the administrative adjustments. Administrative adjustments have um, specific qualifications and uh, outlined in the code that, she, that need to be met. Um, these deviations are permitted per what um, I just read um, under the code as part of the plan district. So the first uh, deviation is uh, specific building type standards related to transparency. Um, transparency will be applicable on the west, south, and east facades. Um, these are applicable on street facing facades and the private drive that runs through the development um, meets the um, definition of a street. So uh, these standards are applicable to all three of those sides. This is the west elevation. Um, they are proposing a 29% transparency. Um, a lot of this de is dependent on the rooms that are inside. Um, along with landscaping that's proposed um, along the front, especially on, on this picture on the right hand side where there is um, a door, there is proposed to be landscaping there to soften that. Um, rooms across the elevation from left to right are an office and then the lobby and then another office and then the break room which is where your door comes in and then storage on the counter or on the corner. The south elevation um, requesting 17% transparency across this uh, elevation. Um, those windows are actually going to be the lobby which um, comes out from the building um, and then you're going to have a storage room, a mechanical room, restrooms and then the window um, is a conference room and then the teller uh, windows. Um, typically you don't have windows and restrooms and mechanical rooms. Um, again, the applicant is providing um, landscaping along that facade to help uh, soften um, the facade. Additionally, um, the intent is of the transparency is to be able to relate pedestrian traffic to the inside of the building. Um, this facade and the next facade that we're going to talk about um, has no pedestrian access. Uh, there's no sidewalk along this side of the building. Um, this is a one-way drive to get to the drive-through lanes. Um, so there, it doesn't really meet the intent of needing the transparency as much as um, another elevation might. And that's the same with this elevation. Um, the proposal is 21% transparency. Across this room, uh, or across this elevation, you're gonna see conference rooms um, where you see the windows, um, a deposit and viewing room, and then your uh, teller windows, and then a mechanical deposit and a work room, which is basically behind the, the deposit door and behind the ATM that's there. And, um, dealing with some uh, things behind there. Um, again, there will be landscaping along the, um, on your picture, what is the left-hand side. Um, the, that screen fence uh, screens um, air conditioning units. So there's, there's other things 
and again, not an area where um, pedestrian traffic will be or is encouraged. Uh, the next deviation is from landscape design. Um, this is for foundation planning. Area shall be eight feet deep. Um, proposed on the south and east facades is five feet deep. Um, these are the areas specifically that we're talking about. Again, this is the area that there would be no reason for pedestrians to be. Um, and so with this uh, landscape area, softening it. Um, I've talked with our resident landscape, landscape architect. Um, the, the proposed landscaping material um, will be able to survive in five feet width, ideally eight feet, um, but the planting materials will still um, thrive. Um, the third deviation is for parking lot design. Parking lot, parking dimensions for 90 degree parking, nine and a half feet wide, 18 and a half feet deep, and 25 foot aisle wide widths. Um, Upkin is proposing 10 feet wide stalls just on the north side specifically. Um, originally, there was a proposal to have a canopy over this area for solar panels, and um, having that area over there and the necessary to be able to um, be able to get in and out of your cars, especially on the end. Um, parking stalls was why um, that was originally needed, the 10 feet parking stalls. Um, they uh, decided that they would leave them for their um, customers that have the larger trucks. Um, they serve a lot of farmers and business people that drive the larger vehicles, so they um, are leaving those for those um, people with the larger vehicles. Staff recommends approval of the final development plan, FDP 1807 for Mid-America Bank with the following condition, to record a 26 foot wide cross access easement in the location of the North-South Drive on the western portion of the property prior to the release of the building plans for a building permit. And then here's your recommended motion. Just a note, um, technically the property does have a standing um, address of South Gardner Road. Um, that is something that we can change, but um, that is conversation with the applicant. As it stands, that's the address of the property today. So that's why you see a South Gardner Road and the staff report um, refers to a South Center Street it should be South Center Street, so. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> is the applicant here this evening? And would like to present? This would be a great time. Thank you, I'm Dave Hill. Oh, should I say, you want my address too, I guess? Uh, Dave Hill, uh, address is 328 East 1400 Road, Baldwin City, Kansas, and uh, here, uh, we're a family-owned bank. Uh, we have locations in Baldwin, Lawrence, Wellsville. Looking to come into, excited to come into Gardner. Uh, we do about 50% of our business in Douglas right now. 25% in Franklin, 25% in Johnson, and without a location in Johnson. So we're real excited about the opportunity that we have here to uh, come in and put in a good location and be a part of the community. Um, we, we specialize in real estate lending, and that's kind of our niche that we focus on. Uh, primarily, uh, again, in those counties we talked about. Uh, so we just, we'll be a full service bank, and again, believe you know we want to be a part of the community and support the community and come in and do business. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak at all this evening on this item? Okay, Commissioner. Do we have to add those to the motion if we all approve, or is that just go? Is that just implied, or 
Um, they're they're shown that way on the site plan. So okay. in the motion, you're accepting the site plan okay, with good. that date. So you would be and, accepting those deviations. Okay. I didn't have any questions, but I love that there's the solar panels built into the the building. I think that's just a green a great green choice. So thanks. Nothing. I don't have anything other. I don't either because Michelle already answered my question. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I would entertain a motion on this item. A motion after review of application FDP-18-07, a final development plan for Mid-America Bank to be located at 18365 South Gardner Road. And final development plan dated October 1st, 2018 and staff report dated October 23rd, 2018. The Planning Commission approves the application as proposed, provided the following condition is met. One, record a 26-foot wide cross-access easement in the location of the North-South Drive on the western portion of the property prior to the release of the building plans for a building permit. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Bowden and a second by Commissioner McNear that after review of application FDP-18-07, the final development plan for Mid-America Bank to be located at 18365 South Gardner Road and final development plan dated October 1st, 2018 and staff report dated October 23rd, 2018. The Planning Commission approves the application as proposed provided the following condition is met. One, record a 26 foot wide cross access easement in the location of the North South Drive on the western portion of the property prior to release of the building plans for a building permit. Any additional discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Regular agenda item number three. Price chopper tax increment financing TIF project plan. Make a finding that the Press Chopper TIF project plan is consistent with the comprehensive plan. I have a staff presentation. We'll actually have a presentation by Bond Council that has helped prepare this document for you. Okay. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Tyler Ellsworth. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Kutak Rock, as Larry said, the city's Bond Council. And in that capacity, we frequently assist with economic development matters. Uh, and so tonight we're here requesting your consideration of a TIF project plan, which is very similar to what you looked at last month at your meeting in connection with the new price chopper. So as part of the TIF proceedings, uh, the statutory process by which the city can offer uh, TIF assistance as an incentive to supermarket developers, uh, the developer of the new price chopper, most of those actions and decisions occur at the city council uh, and the proceedings are there before them. The one exception is at the start of consideration of a project plan, uh, sort of one component of a larger development in a TIF district, the planning commission is requested to make a finding that the elements of that project plan are consistent with the intent of the city's comprehensive plan. So that request is before you this evening and specifically the project plan encompasses the proposed new price chopper as well as a future pad site to be developed west of the existing quick trip and off of Main Street. So I'm happy to answer any questions on that but the request is that you make a finding in uh, that's consistent with the recommended motion in the staff report. Okay. Thank you. Uh, commissioner discussion? Sorry, I'm all right. I thought there was going to be more to it than that. Uh, <clears throat> I've got nothing, to be honest. I have no questions. I'm good. No questions? I don't have anything. Uh, I don't either. So with that, I would entertain a motion on this item. After review of the redevelopment TIF project plan for Main Street Marketplace Redevelopment District, Project Area 1 for a grocery store be located northwest of Moonlight Road and U.S. Highway 56, which is East Main Street in Gardner, Kansas. A staff report dated October 23, 2018. The Planning Commission finds that the project plan is consistent with the City of Gardner comprehensive plan 
as amended based upon the following, uh, following findings of fact. Number one, the proposed project is consistent with the applicable future land use, community mixed use for the site and the intent to provide retail and professional services for the everyday needs of the people residing or working in the community, including grocery and retail stores. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Brady with a second by Commissioner Bowden <coughs> that after review of the redevelopment TIF project plan for the Main Street Marketplace Redevelopment District, Project Area 1 for a grocery store to be located northwest of Moonlight Road and U.S. Highway 56, East Main Street in Gardner, Kansas, and staff report dated October 23, 2018, the Planning Commission finds that the project plan is consistent with the City of Gardner Comprehensive Plan as amended based on the following findings of fact. One, the proposed project is consistent with the applicable future land use, community mixed use for the site and the intent to provide retail and professional services for the everyday needs of people residing or working in the community, including grocery and retail stores. Any additional discussion? This wasn't a public hearing, I don't know. It was not. Just making sure. Thank you. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. That concludes our regular agenda items. We will now move to discussion items. Discussion item number one, A, uh, text amendments, discussion of current standards and alternatives pertaining to driveway configuration for duplex development. Good evening, Commissioners. Kelly Drake Woodward, Chief Planner. I'm getting to talk to you when you're fresh. No comments, so you're all ready to comment, right? <laughs> okay. So, uh, Hmm, I can't seem to get it talking to me. Just so we could all start on the same page with the land development code, I wanted to start by talking just briefly about what a form-based code is um, and a little cautionary statement. It's important to understand that the Gardner Land Development Code is a citywide form-based code. So it integrates development and design standards into the code. Unlike traditional zoning codes, form-based codes, focus on the physical character and the quality of the public space or how this built environment and the open spaces that line a street frame or relate to the street. So if you look at that picture on the slide, it's about how that area relates, the private development and the public development. So keep this frame in mind, please, when we're, we're talking about the code. Also, these codes are not just about beautification. Uh, they are an intentional strategy for our improvement. They are carefully calibrated to boost the economic environment of the city in a way that's compatible with the market based on the local experience of the consultants and the people that participated in putting them together. So uh, be careful about straying from the intent, the initial intent. In developing a form-based code, community input is obtained on desired character, resulting in an adopted proactive policy that's supposed to drive the desired form and implement the community vision. So we want to be careful not to stray from that vision. Also, form-based codes are very community-specific and place-specific, so we want to be careful of comparisons to other cities also. They are holistic, meaning they address both the private and the public space designed to create the whole space or the whole place. So this includes buildings, streets, sidewalks, parks, parking. And in the case of Gardner, it looks like street types, open and civic space types, building types, and frontage types. 
So we need to be careful to consider the impact on the whole of the whole code. These, all, these codes also have closely integrated standards to ensure compatibility of all city making ingredients with the goal of building a better city. So they help ensure that private development is working together with the community interest. So we have to be careful when we change one part of the code to consider the whole code. So in summary, the standards within the form based code have to be considered holistically within the context of the entire code and the vision documents on which they're based. Now you should revisit them regularly after they're put into practice and when you have evidence of the resulting built environment from those proactive codes. And then um, you might want to revisit when the economy is evolving or when the community changes its objectives. So right now this code is based on the 2014 Gardner Comprehensive Plan as amended. Okay, the first discussion item, which we need your input on, are duplex driveways. The City Council has asked the Planning Commission to revisit a couple of topics. Um, there is limited evidence of the resulting built environment in relation to duplex environment at this time. Uh, this was driven by developer concerns. The Planning Commission is tasked with revisiting the standards and um, with all the things that I just talked about in mind. So you should consider if anything changed in the economy or express community objectives. As stated in the introduction about the holistic code, um, we have to look at multiple regulations when we talk about duplex driveways. Driveway design for duplex is inter, uh, influenced by three things that are inter, interrelated. And they're also tied to other building types and other frontage types. So it's more like a web um, than an island. The building type standards for duplexes include garage limits that influence the prominence and the width of garages on front facing facades. Amending the standard would only involve amending the duplex building type and would only um, impact that building type, but it is closely related to access uh, widths and allocation of space requirements for hard services for driveways that lead up to those garages. Uh, the frontage type standards um, include the access width limits or the width of the driveway and allocation of space requirements, which is percent of total hardscape uh, in the area from the front building line to the front property line. A change to these standards would involve amending that frontage type, but each um, that frontage type would impact multiple building types. Three, duplex detached house suburban and de detached house estate. So you have to kind of think of it in terms of that context too, is that it would also impact those other, other things. So let's talk about each of these three standards and the intent behind them. Why do we even want to limit front garages? Uh, the Land Development Code states that duplexes are to resemble a detached house in outward design and appearance to support compatibility within neighborhoods. So garage limits are meant to support that intent. Front garages elevate a vehicular oriented rather than a pedestrian oriented public environment and can have a detrimental impact on neighborhood walkability. Garage limits support residential design that orient porches and windows to the front of the lot. So that supports crime prevention, safety and security through eyes on the street. This is something that Jane Jacobs, um, pioneer planner, first talked about years ago in New York context. Having people with eyes on the street keeps people safe. Garage limits support enduring property values through a more visually attractive, vital streetscape, lending traditional neighborhood character. So currently, um, the intent or how garage limits are defined is 
certain building types due to their close relationship to the streetscape and or narrow lots with frequent repetition along a block should limit front loaded garage access. Um, that's expressed as a maximum width of the front facade at the front building line. Um, or if the garages are set back further, a different limit, a less restrictive limit on the garage. So, and it also says when front loaded garages cannot work within these standards, side, rear, or rear access garages should be used. So the intent is to encourage people to use those other options. So this is a prototype design uh, that the city of Gardner commissioned to kind of illustrate the intent of the code um, for these alternate access standards. So if you look from left to right in this plan, um, the access strategies include on street parking on the left side with the orange buildings, um, shared internal rear access drives uh, for the duplexes, the purple buildings there in the center, and also the pink buildings on the bottom. Alley access, that's the kind of coral colored buildings towards the right. And on the far right, shared driveways with side loaded garages. So we wanted to look at other areas, regulations, just to see what they're doing. Um, on the slide is listed Gardner standards. So if, it, if the garages are placed, or the first thing you see or you encounter at the front building line, they can only be 25% of the entire facade length. Um, if they're set back 15 feet, a minimum of 15 feet, they can be up to 45% of the entire facade and there is no limit to the garages if they have the side rear or detached access detached garage access are we holding questions to the end um possibly did you want to ask something now though that goes with the slide about understanding the standard yeah the setback is it 15 feet from the start of the building or 15 feet from the road from the start of the building okay. That's yes that's a good question um, Olathe standard is 50% um, at the front of the building, or 28 feet, whichever is greater, but no limit if they're set back a minimum of five feet or if they're side facing. So that's significantly less restrictive. Uh, Blue, Str Blue Springs is the same as ours, 25%. Um, no limit if set back 12 to 20 feet. So they just have a, a different setback requirement for the uh, larger limit. Uh, Liberty, it appeared to me that they don't allow front-facing garages for attached single family. Um, so this is a development actually being developed in Olathe that shows both of these things. Uh, the front-loaded ones are at the top and the bottom and then the rear loaded duplexes are in the middle. I tr you know, I just had to use uh, pictures so the bottom one's still under construction, but that's what they look like right now. So I tried to help you visualize what's going on here. Um, the ones on the left would not meet our garage limit requirements, either because they take up greater than 25% of the facade length you know, right at the front building line. Or um, because they're set back, but they're not set back the 15 feet, so they can't really be the 45%. Just the question is for clarification. Yes. Uh, when you talk about these setbacks, this, this might be an additional Commissioner Gardner was asking. Is that from the build line, or what is that? That's correct. It's from the front building line. So it's the okay. nearest part of the building to okay. the street. So that's, that's with the setback from the street to the front build line. Is that correct? There is a building setback, a minimum like 25 feet okay. from the property line. But this just talks about um, how much of the garage can take up that front facade based on whether it's fully so forward the, or it, setback. So at the front of the structure is at the build line and the garage is set back, 
Yes. From that so line. if you look at that picture on the right in the middle, okay. And and yeah, you look at that, the one on the exactly left okay. right next to it. So the one on the left, the garages are the most prominent part, but on the one on the right, the house is the most prominent part. Okay. Thank you. So it's really just flipping those. So well, instead of the garages being the nearest okay. thing, the house would be the nearest thing. So you'd have that eyes on the street and actually setting the garages back gives you more room for parking. As I look at that, though, the uh, the difference between the left and the right is you're looking at a two-car uh, configuration on the left versus the one-car That is true, yep. Yeah. And to get the two-car configuration on, on you know, set back on the right, you'd need significantly more lot space. Yes, that's true. I just had trouble finding any examples of duplexes with the setback, so you're not I had to go it. with what I could get. <laughs> yeah. It's not economically feasible. So, and that's something we'll talk about okay. too. Um, right now, I'm just trying to help people sure. visu visualize. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. That's absolutely what you're here for. So, um, the top one is an example of one front entry and one side entry. It could just as easily be a two-car garage as a one-car garage, but um, so most likely the side entry garage would be shared with the next unit over. And then the bottom one is a rear access garage. So you probably have a shared access to get behind that building to access those driveways. And this is, kind of shows the floor plans. This one does have a uh, double car garage that is set back on the bottom right. Just the floor plan. So, but you can see it is a wider building. It would require a wider lot. Maybe not as deep a lot, but a wider lot. And then there's two that have the side and front entry and then one with the rear entry. Does it kind of help just visualize the options? Okay. Um, is it okay if we move on to the next standard and then we get, after we kind of explain all of them, then we can go back to the garage limits and see if you have any comments on that, or would you like to talk right now about garage limits? I prefer to go on. Keep going. Okay. Uh, the access width uh, limit, the reason for them uh, is actually to free up space for public infrastructure in the right of way. So, um, all, all the study communities regulate the driveway width, at least within the right of way. Um, so you want to accommodate those street trees, uh, fire hydrants, mailboxes, utilities, and such. It also helps support the pedestrian realm so that people do not have to walk across as long expanses of driveways if they're using the sidewalk. And hopefully they don't have to avoid cars that are backing out or a lot of times cars park on the sidewalk too. So we're trying to kind of limit that opportunity. Um, some communities do address driveway width on private property as well. Um, and they do this by limiting the paved surfaces in the front yard. So most of Gardner's frontage types do limit the access width in the entire frontage area. But the suburban yard frontage type that you amended uh, recently only addresses the access width in the right of way. So it's the least restrictive of any of the frontage types for access width. And currently it's at 30% maximum of the lot width measured at the front building line. And this is because, you know, on those pie shaped lots, on the cul de sacs, we're not going to, you know, measure it at that tiny part out by the right of way. We measure it where the building is actually set. Neighborhood yard, just for comparison, is 15%. So uh, that was amended in December of 2016. Now that frontage type, suburban yard frontage type, is meant to be used primarily on standard streets. And that really is only the preferred road type on arterial streets. But we've been using it on existing laws that were created you know, per former code, so. Oops. These are the area regulations that we researched. 
Only gardener bases the access width within the right of way on a percentage of lot width. So it, it actually relates it to the development context by scaling the driveway. Um, this is the regulation that will most directly affect the pedestrian environment of these three. Uh, Blue Springs does relate access width to lot width, except they um, exempt single and two family residential from this. Others have a set maximum width based on the driveway configuration or the garage width. So of these ranges here, for separate driveways, regulations range from 18 foot maximum to 35 foot maximum. And for combined drives, they range from 24 foot maximum to 44 foot maximum. That's if there's two two car garage, two car driveways. And hopefully um, you do have that in a table also as well in your packet if you'd like to look at that a little bit more. Um, these are just some examples of driveway widths for various lot widths. So they range from um, lot sizes of 70 foot to 142 feet, which might accommodate that longer uh, building with the uh, setback garage. Uh, the driveway approach width would range from 21 foot to 42.6 foot total, although no one driveway can be greater than 24 feet wide. Remember, we're talking about duplexes here, so we're within that context. Okay, and then just to share with you the reasoning behind the limits on the front hardscape. It is meant to control the amount of impervious surface in uh, the frontage area. So it's the only standard that we have in the land development code other than building coverage over the entire lot. It's the only standard we have to control impervious surfaces near the right of way. And this supports better stormwater management. It also creates a more attractive public realm uh, with abutting properties that can attain a balance of vegetation with hard surfaces. And it makes it so it's not all about cars, it's also about creating places for people, basically. So this is the current standard and that was actually revised. It was first <coughs> adopted at 15% maximum and like, we're like, whoa, this really isn't workable. Uh, so we changed it to 40%. And really, we haven't had problems, for the most part, with driveways meeting this standard since it was revised. So that changed in 2014 as well? It changed in December of 2016. Okay. We had, uh, the code went into effect in August. And by December, we'd realized this is kind of off, so. So these are the area regulations, they're pretty, you know, consistent in a range, actually ranges from 0% to 50% because Liberty says you can't have a driveway in the front yard, but obviously you could have a driveway going through the front yard to the back. Um, so the typical range is 35 to 50%. Um, ours is 40. There is one jur jurisdiction that limits the width in the front yard rather than a percent, but regulating by percent is common. Uh, this is a visual of the other access strategies that the Land Development Code provides as options. They are supposed to be for different contexts. Um, hopefully you got a chance to read through where those are meant to be used. There are some examples of what results from the, that 40% calculation if you assume a minimum building setback of 25 feet. 75, uh, 70 foot wide lot, you can have one 28 foot wide driveway or two 14 foot wide driveways, for example, on down the line. Okay, and just to kind of um, show you some of the stuff that's out there already, Willow Chase uh, duplexes, that was not a planned district. Okay, so they did not have all those options for deviations that exist with plan districts. Um, a lot of it was developed, it's been developed in different phases from 2002 through 2010 and then uh, the 
over the part for number four was developed in 2017 through current. So our from, former code had the same lot requirements as the current code for lot size, minimum lot size, 10,000 square feet for a duplex minimum and a 70 foot wide lot minimum. So we didn't change the minimum lot size standards in the code. We really didn't, we only slightly revised uh, the setback requirements. They're pretty much the same. Uh, the former code, it kind of went, different things happened with this. Um, it did say you had to have two side-by-side -side off street parking spaces for each dwelling unit and um, a minimum width, one car driveway was 12 foot, the minimum width for two car driveway is 24. And then it, it listed ingress and egress by means of paved driveways not exceeding 35 feet in width. Um, but the, that was for the private property part of the driveways. For the right of way, um, up until 2014, the standard for duplexes was 18 foot wide for each unit, regardless of frontage. And multiple driveways had to be separated by a landscape strip at least four foot wide. Then in about 2014, I think they switched to public work standard, uh, which was based on the Latha's requirement, which was 24 foot total for a one car garage or 12 foot for each unit and 44 foot for a two car garage or 22 feet each unit. That's in the right of way. At least I think that's what they did. So um, this is kind of an example. You can see how we look at plot plans when we're evaluating these standards. So th there's the image of it up on top of this unit and the plot plan that goes with it. It's 65% of the front of the building is garage. 37% hardscape in the frontage area. So that would meet our standard today. But it had 50% access width, which exceeds the 30% that we would allow currently. This one. Um, similar, except it has even more garage, 77% garage, 32% of hardscape. And it actually does meet our access with the requirement because they tucked it in. So these, these are just providing you with some more visuals. You can see how the cars have a tendency to migrate over the sidewalk in some cases for these duplexes. They often have less problems meeting our allocation of space standards if they do move the buildings back a little bit further, especially with um, cul-de-sac lots. This one, um, even though, um, yeah, it's pretty much the same story, I guess, except it, the only one it doesn't meet is the garage limits. And this is a new one at Willow Chase that just got built. And they did get administrative adjustments to build this uh, duplex. Um, for the garage limits, they just had to make it, meet an equal or better standard for the intent of the code. So they proposed to use carriage door doors for the garage doors and put in additional landscaping. We accepted that um, and administrative adjustment for them. And then they had some adjustments, small adjustments for hardscape and driveway widths. They were trying to builds, keep building similarly to their past development. Uh, these are some other ones, Meadows of Aspen Creek, all front loaded garages, straight access in and out. Here's how they stack up. They, they would not meet our garage limits uh, or allocation of space or access with currently. There's another one. Also, it does meet the allocation of space, the hardscape standard. Uh, this one is the Holt Graver edition. And the interesting thing about this one is it does use those shared access drives between the units. 
Um, so if you look at that plot plan, only 37% of the front facade is garage, which doesn't meet our 25%, but it's closer <laughs> than the others. 34% uh, hardscape, which meets our standard, and 32% access width, which barely doesn't meet our standard. Okay, so this is where I would like you to discuss these issues and perhaps if you can provide some policy guidance for us and for the governing body. Um, starting with the garage limits, so generally problems have only occurred when we have a developer who wants to pair a suburban building design with a more compact urban lot configuration. So bigger homes with multiple front-loaded garages on small lots. So um, this really doesn't help those duplexes look like single-family homes, which is what the code intends. It does not necessarily encourage eyes on the street and safety. And it does create a lot of concrete for pedestrians to have to maneuver over when they're on the sidewalk. But as I said, we have used that administrative adjustment process to overcome some of those objections uh, by developers. And then we've also had two local developers who have modified their building plans to comply with the code more closely. And you've seen the cottages at University Park that are planned. Um, and then we had another um, builder do a single duplex fill, infill development. So we do wanna consider um, What's it, you know, the perception if we revise the standard so long, so soon after we had such a long and exhaustive process um, to adopt a code consistent with the plan without giving it time to achieve the results it's intended to achieve? Um, and would those people who have met it or tried to meet it, you know, how would they feel if we change it now? Um, if they do meet with difficulties, they can ask for that administrative adjustment. And so, but if you do think it needs to be revised some, these are suggestions, perhaps. Um, change it to 30% limit at the front building line, and if they set it back, maybe increase to 60%. Then you have to think, well, what's a more reasonable setback? Is 15% or is 15 foot a reasonable minimum setback? Do you want it to be less? Um, and then just provide some basis for or reasoning, you know, for that change. Please, if you, you give us some policy guidance so we know how to argue your case. Okay. <clears throat> My commission discussion. I'm going to go ahead and write So, um, I don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll just start with the percentage of um, facade. So, I was just running some rough numbers um, while you were talking about access width limits. So I don't have much to say about that because I was actually focused on the first part, uh, which was garage limits. But uh, with the way that the code is written, it appears that it would cost the developer about $3,300 extra to comply with facade limits per duplex if they are to set back by 15 feet. And I'm basing that off of an additional 660 square feet of driveway that they would have to lay. If that makes any sense. So if we're talking about a 44 inch wide or 44 foot wide span for a, for a duplex double garage, they would have to run an additional 660 square feet of concrete. So I think that <clears throat> that might make a developer balk because if they're going to do 20 duplexes, that's a you know seventy thousand dollar charge essentially to lay extra concrete, given it's about five dollars per square foot per four concrete. Um, the way around that, though, is even more costly if they wanted to put, say, a rear access, because um, then to lay a quarter mile of road is about $26,000, I think, give or take, for a personal 
like drive. So if they did a rear access, they would still have to pay for the concrete to get the rear access to the driveway. But I think that would be more cost prohibitive to do it that way, but I'm not 100% sure. So I guess, I don't know what I'm arguing for. <laughs> I haven't made an impassioned plea, but I, I, don't, I don't dislike it, let me put it that way. And I don't even mind, I don't necessarily mind the 15 feet, but maybe we can ease up on that. Because every foot we go back would be an additional 44 square feet of, if we're assuming a, a dual or you know double garage for a, a duplex. So if it's for every foot we go back, that's an additional expense of you know hundreds of dollars. Okay. I'll wait. I'll wait till it's my turn. Oh, okay. So. I, I, maybe that's just a suggestion is, is the setback might be changed just a little bit as opposed to 15, you know, maybe 10. Uh, would, go ahead. Based on the, the 10 foot versus 15, do you want to relate that to a change in the amount of garage coverage space because we're going up to 45% when we're back 15, would you keep the 45 then at the 10? Yes, so 45 at 10 would be, or maybe even, maybe even more, if, if that makes any sense. Like maybe 10 feet, but you get 50%. So I would do both, if it makes any sense. Increase the percentage of the side, as well as slightly decrease. Not, not too bad, because I still want that that variance, I think it would look, I personally would like to, to see that on more duplexes where the house is more prominent than the garage. But I also don't want it to be cost prohibitive for someone to develop these. So 10 foot setback would say 50% would be fine with me as long as the, that makes any sense. Then we just have to take into consideration the 40% concrete coverage hardscape. We probably just have to do some calculations with some actual plot plans and see how that affects it because I don't know if we want to just shoot a number out there. But I, I think that the, the, the hardscape offset is not out of alignment if we're getting less garage and more building. That's a, kind of like a trade off in my mind that we're getting what we and the fact that we don't just look at garage doors as we drive down the street. And the amount of hardscape that you're picking up is probably really not that much greater than overall than what you would have if they were side mounted like you were talking about earlier. So we're just talking about the garage limits on the duplex building type, right? We're not looking yes, at Yes, that's all we were right? asked to look at, so. Yes, sir, we're just trying to consider duplexes. In this one. So what, um, what were developers telling you, or were they telling you, and this is what initiated the, what were they, what were they saying? What was their biggest? Uh, usually the objection was that they had a different building in mind that they built something different than this and they didn't want to spend the money to design a different building. Were they telling you how much it, like how cost prohibitive, it, how much were they actually incurring? Or did they, well, that's a good question. Or were, I, I guess never mind. They're going to tell you it's millions of dollars that they're incurring. Mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. I think it's the redesign cost as well. Right. Not just the additional build cost. So well, that's that's what I thought you were asking about was the redesign costs, and I'm not sure how much. Yeah, yeah. No, it'd be construction actually, costs. Yeah, actually, oh. that didn't. Well, that that wasn't crossing my mind, but now that you say it, it is now. Um, so, are they bringing basically like this is what we always build? Yes. And then, and then you're having to say, well, that's not what we want. Um, I'm having to say <clears throat> that's not what our code supports. Um, I don't know. I, I, can we, can I yield my time and think a little longer? Yeah. But come back to me? Yeah, we'll come back. It's fine. So of those developers that come, 
and don't necessarily want to comply to our codes. Do they leave? Do you give the administrative adjustment? There's usually a resolve, I assume. We're not turning people away. Well, we've had one that left for a while. They're coming back for rezoning. I don't know what their intention is in the future. Um, otherwise, we've accommodated them um, through administrative adjustments. Or they've made a slight change. So if they had two front-facing garages, they just turned one and then redesigned the driveway, So, which wasn't a big change for them because it didn't affect the interior layout. It still doesn't put much of the building up front, you know, but technically it meets our code. I, um, I'm not opposed to our current code, but I'm not opposed to if we change it. It does seem like though, even changing it to 30% of the facade of the front building line, based on those pictures you showed us, that's not even still gonna be close enough you're going to have to probably give administrative adjustments or something because 30 percent is not going to cut it i guess my thought of I, it was just that probably is more typical of what a single family home looks like so i just threw that mm. number out there uh, i don't what are our single single family home limits Do you we know don't have uh for detached house suburban building type there's no garage limit okay i was thinking through all the houses in my neighborhood and none of them are anywhere close to so since this is typically two garages right by each other that's why we we have more we have stricter yes it's just that that you have such repetition and such prominence of those features I don't really have any questions, and like I said, I'm not really opposed to the current standards or changing them. I just don't really want to lose developers, and we need all sorts of all types of building types here in Gardner. And I don't want to limit us, but I would be opposed to changing it either. Okay. Uh, I got several things I wanted to ask about. Uh, first off, I'm going to preface what I meant my, my discussion time. Uh, I've worked with builders and developers on a professional basis. Uh, I also deal with what the market wants and costs. So uh, I guess one of the first things I want to start, can you refresh my memory, why the percentage versus uh, hard feet uh, with the garage space? why why we have the garage limits no no why do we have percentage of frontage versus feet well like, it is percent like a, a, a of the facade curl. length what's that it's percent of the facade length in feet right. what what drove that what drove that standard? well because that way if you're going to build a it's related to the scale of the building okay. not the lot Because one of the, uh, first of all, I want to start is uh, one of the things that, that you run into, I drive a lot of uh, residential neighborhoods on a daily basis. And one of the things, and I'll, I'll reference it right here to Gardner where we, where we all live, uh, over on Woodson Lane, all those uh, townhomes over there. One of the things that is extremely, that's a big problem in that particular residential area, and the reason a lot of people don't want to live in that area, Ex you know, put aside backside 35, that's not part of this discussion, is those typically have single car garages. Try to find a place to park anywhere close to any one of those residential units on a daily basis, and particularly on weekends and evenings, and you're not going to find it. And, limit, and where I'm coming from with the limiting of these uh, garage spaces, going to, uh, to these restrictive limits will force builders to go to single car garages, which exactly uh, flies in the face of encroachment of sidewalk space, because what do they do? They stack their, they stack their, their cars in the garage and it goes right over the sidewalk. So you're defeating 
a lot of your purpose. And where I was coming from, from a, a hard footage requirement versus percent of the facade, if you say, if you limit to 12 or 14 feet, 15 feet, that, that'll dictate a single car garage for those types of units. If you go to 24, 20, or 20, 22, or 24 foot, that will allow for two car garages. And then back to Commissioner Gardner, the question on cost. Now, does it, the 15 percent or 15 foot setback drive a concrete cost? It also drives the building costs to either the setback and then one of the, some of the least expensive square footage. I and mean, everybody wants more square footage. One of the things that drives square footage is the cheapest place on a duplex like this that you can build is over a garage space. So you can you can have bedrooms and you can have multiple levels and you can stack things and it's, it really comes down to an economic development and an economic and dollar issue. And to come back to trying to make duplexes look like single family, the reason duplexes are built because they cost less, uh, just on every part of the scale. So that, you know, that, Sorry, I'm rambling here, but this is this is these are the things that are really issues. They're not builder so much things as they are with the marketplace. And, and if we want to be competitive in the in the community of Gardner, we need to really kind of stop and think about these issues as dollar and cents issues, as market driven issues, and whether or not we're going to uh, encourage builders and developers to come to our community or we're going to drive them away. So can I? Um Get, Does that make sense? Can you clarify for me about your point about the garage, I mean the living space above the garage? Sure. If you went back to some of, where the, where some of the, the duplex space above the garage in the pictures. Yeah, I, I just, so your okay. thoughts right, are right that. Right there, okay, on the uh, the very first one you had. This one? No, no. You, you, toward the end of your presentation. Towards the end of your presentation. Go back. Oh, I'm sorry. You blasted past it. Keep going. Right. No, no. keep going. Okay, right here. Top right. Uh, the area above the garage is very inexpensive space because it doesn't require a foundation. Right. Uh, you don't have the roof. Uh, uh, you don't have the roof component over the garage in the house itself, okay? So, so your, the expense is in foundation, roof structure, that's where your biggest expenses in a building are. And here what you're doing is you're maximizing the use of both. So and you're thinking that the garage limits preclude them from building that over the garage? It's a, and it also uh, sits there. A lot of these uh, duplexes are are owned by develop or by uh, investors, correct? They're rental units, a good share of them. Some are privately owned, but you know, I'll I'll address the the investor owned units first. And that yeah. is when when you start uh, increasing the cost of a of a building significantly, what that drives into uh, is rent is that drives and, con and directly converts into the rental prices mm -hmm. and when you start driving rental prices above uh, certain rates then, you, then single family housing becomes more of an economic choice for a lot of people and what, what the builders and developers and particularly investors are looking to try to do I'm generalizing here is is to build and, and try to keep things where they can maximize square footage be competitive give people what they want and, and keep the cost of rents down. Also, uh, you know, another thing that drives in this particular case, two car garages create much less of a problem of the things you're looking to eliminate, which is uh, sidewalk encroachment and, and safety over one car garage. Because what happens there is people you know, tend to stack car, stack, uh, stack driveways that encroaches sidewalks. Uh, you know, it also increases people having to jockey cars around, and, and the whole the whole concept of trying to restrict the use. What, you're, what happens is the feel, and I, I'm sure you've probably heard. Have you heard from developers that this that these issues are are concerns for them? 
Well, I th I'm wondering if maybe we have a disconnect here because our, our percent is not the square footage of the facade, that it's the length. I understand. Okay. Well, so what I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to drive to is two car versus one car limitations. One car, uh, one car garage uh, standards will fit well within your current limitations. If they're front loaded. Yes. Yeah. And that's typically the least expensive way to, to build duplexes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that part. I was just a little confused uh, on how no, they related it, it, to the garages. Push, I think what, it, what he's referring to is if you push your garages back 15 feet so that you get that extra percentage, you're losing that 15 feet above the garage. Okay. And exactly. therefore you have less square footage of gotcha. the space. Right. And okay. looking, at, looking at this duplex in particular, it can't, there's nothing you can do to this duplex to continue to keep two two-car garages because the lots are too condensed. Mm -hmm. So if you push that back 15 feet, you're gonna have like the longest, thinnest mm -hmm. run of exactly. where you walk in and it's a hallway, which would be kind of interesting, a uh, house. But it would be a 15 foot long hallway because that's about how wide you get yeah. on the sides of the, of the, the, the duplex. Yeah, I agree with you that our standards require re-envisioning duplexes. There's yes. not a good way to take these and make them comply. Well, when you were looking at Willow Chase, in the middle developments of Willow Chase, uh, where was that one that had the whole, whole development? Okay. Right there. Yeah. Uh, as you look at this, uh, when you look at the uh, street number one and you look on uh, the right hand side, uh, third or fourth unit from the top, that's how builders typically try to build uh, duplexes. Mm -hmm. uh, when you start trying to do things like over here in, in, in row three where, where the, the, the lot's narrow or the driveway's narrow, he's still got his two, two car garages and, and those uh, there's not a one of the, uh, in that, those first two rows. There's not any of these that would meet current design standards. Is that correct? They yes. Th that's correct, right? That's correct. Uh, so what's what's happening here is you're significantly impacting the desirability of our community for for rental type units, and you know because people want two car garages, uh, you know, their families are bigger. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. And I'm and I'm sorry, sir, but uh, I, I want to just clarify one thing. Our intent is not to force them to build one car garage units. We have nothing in the code that keeps them from building what they're currently building, which are two car garage units on the other side. I mean, just just sure. what you currently see. And if you look at number four, which is the most current set of buildings, and they're still under construction as they go on south. Mm -hmm they they are actually very very similar in configuration to what he built previously because the same gentleman owns all of those right so we're not trying to restrict developers from building this particular style what we're trying to say is is that the code as it's currently written has these particular issues concerning the amount of frontage and hardscape and driveway widths. And so we're asking, are there things that we can adjust that would allow for this to continue, sure. but in a more less restrictive manner than what we currently have in the code. So what we're looking for are methods from you to help us address this issue through code adjustments, which is where Mr. Gardner was going with this. Um, we're not, yeah, through administrative adjustments or some other right. some other form. We're not trying to restrict or make them build something that they don't want to build, but we are mm -hmm. suggesting in some cases that a different format or lot structure or whatever, mm -hmm. when they're going through new subdivisions where they have the opportunity to pick the way they want their lots configured, could give them some opportunities to do something different. But we're not making them Okay. Follow a specific building formula. 
I think where I was going, and this comes back to what I asked the question at the front end of what I, my comments. I think one of the things that would be helpful in answer your question to me is, uh, I think something that uh, defining a, a number of feet, whether it's 20 or 22 or 24, of you know garage width in the front of each unit. If we go back to uh, you know a hard foot uh, wide limit, that 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 can be uh, you know 20 feet would be sufficient for most uh, for most two car garages. So if you got away from the, you know, the recommendation would be if you got away from the percentage and went back to what some of the communities in the area, such as Olathe, are, are doing and say, look, I think their code's a little bit, uh, there's a lot more, um, less restrictive than ours is. But uh, Olathe? The 20 foot, uh, it's actually a percent of the as well. Which one was it? It was, I, I take that back. It was Lawrence had 20 foot. Well, they had a 24 foot max. Over in the park, had a 35 foot max. That was right off the slide. That wasn't garage limits, though. Right? Well, they had 50% or 28 feet, whichever is greater. Okay. So, what Larry was talking about was built with an administrative adjustment. And the idea of the administrative adjustment we can allow for. Uh, garage limits so because it's a building design standard is they have to equally or better meet the intent of that standard so mm -hmm. if they you know I guess the trade-off for uh, building uh, with those big garages on the front is give us some extra streetscape amenities or the view sure. from the public space you would you know have better quality garages you would have additional landscaping or something to add interest to that street when you're putting that big blank basic sure. wall I mean, there I, I, I'm in agreement with you there uh, simply because you know, when you drive down the street of duplexes and all you see is garage fronts and driveways it's not very attractive it's not inviting to to the people I think but uh, we probably agree on more than we disagree yeah, and it's just a, how do we do this? I think it's come down to what is appropriate to accomplish our goals. And, and I'll sum it up and pass it on to uh, Commissioner Brady. Uh, I, I, my thoughts are if we go to something similar to what, uh, maybe not 50% or 28 feet, but if we went to some percentage or let's say 30% uh, or, or 22 feet or 20 feet, whichever is greater, we went to some kind of a thing which allowed some flexibility and put limits on it. I think that would probably be a, a good compromise. I'll pass off to Mr. Brady. Thank you. Just a couple comments here. First of all, Kelly, thanks for the thorough PowerPoint and all the visual aids. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very helpful to have um, all those examples. I want to follow up on what Joe talked about is what triggered this conversation? <laughs> <laughs> we knew that was going to be asked. We, we've had, um, ever since the code changed, um, we've been tweaking the code to try and address developers' questions. We've had issues that had to do with side yard setbacks. We've had issues with driveway widths. The driveway widths have been changed five times, six times, in order to meet developers' requests. Uh, when we started, they were much more restrictive than they are right now. I mean, we were 10 feet wide, 12 feet wide. Uh, we were, you know, for a double car garage, that's not an appropriate width. No. So, so we we quickly ran through several changes from August to December, trying to get those things addressed, and we pretty much had gotten to the point where both the driveway width and the percentage of hardscape really weren't an issue so much except with duplexes. And the problem we've got is when we have duplexes on cul-de-sacs because then you basically have solid concrete all the way around and we have one picture of that that's in here that I thought was a very good example of that. But the, the effect you've got is overall is we're trying to yeah, this is a good example That's of the bottom right. So the effect that we're trying to do is we're trying to improve the entire quality of the neighborhood through all of these various 
subtle changes, and some of them have to do with what you're visually seeing, the garage or not a garage on the front, the amount of concrete that's there, the amount of parking that's required for a duplex. Um, we try and design these, when you have a double car garage and the setbacks that we currently have, which can be 25 to, isn't it 25 to 30 feet, I believe? Yeah, front, 25 front yards, feet. Front yard setback. Minimum. So within that, and that's behind the property line, so you have room for two cars in a garage and two cars per driveway. That's four units, four vehicles. So we're trying to set them up to have four vehicles per unit, and that's eight vehicles per duplex. That's a lot. And they don't want to have wider streets because they don't want to provide a lot of off on-street parking. So the trade-off here is where do you put the cars and where do you put the guests and all these other things. So all of this goes together to create, to answer your question, sir, is was, was thought through when we went through and met with developers back in the original code review for the land development code. And the suggestions that we got at that point in time were the ones that we came up with originally, which were too stringent, and have been relaxed, relaxed, relaxed. So we've gotten everything pretty much down except for this one building type, which is still struggling. And we have one particular developer who asked for this to be addressed. So and then we've had one other developer that, I'm sorry. Well, so did that one developer contact a council member and that council member said, hey, I'll bring this up? Uh, no, he originally came to us, and we tried to, and we did address it through, through administrative adjustments for him, but it it did Still go beyond that. He went beyond that, of course, and, and complained to to city council, which okay. is fine. We we have no problem, no issue with that. Um, I mean, we try and address it the best we can through the code, but when we can't, then we have to come back and and so the council and and you know in trying to address what they see might be what. Commissioner's uh, councilman is there. Commissioner said a minute ago, which was you know a, a marketing issue and driving people out of town, which we don't want to do. Then they wanted us to review this with you again to see what additional things we could come up with to try and address these issues. So we're having this conversation because we have one developer that wanted the conversation to go further. After all of these reviews, after multiple years, I think you said five times, we've tweaked this. Well, so we tweaked, is that the, wasn't that, really, we is that the reason we're here? Five times, yeah. Because of one developer? Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's all buzzed on one. I'm sure there have been other developers. I'm sure Steve and Joe have heard of other complaints from yeah. people yes. that just haven't come to us, but maybe have complained to them or complained to, to other folks. But I, I'm not trying to say we're all doing this because of one guy, no. Yeah. Uh, Larry, uh, I, I can tell you uh, I've had conversations with builders and developers that have that have built in garden built and developed in garden and at this point they said unless significant changes are made never again and you know so i mean what i'm trying to kind of share with this is from personal experience conversations that i have on a regular basis and i think that as you look at this uh and, and this, this cul-de-sac you know you have at the bulb of a cul-de-sac there's a lot of concrete there and, and but if you start converting those to single car garages to meet code, uh, then you're going to start creating. You know, it, it's it becomes an issue of which problem do you want to have and which one do you want to solve. Well, for, for me, the codes have been changed, evaluated by this group for years, approved by the city council for years, and and we're back here again. It just doesn't make sense to me. At some point, we say, "This is what we got," and I, I the threats of we're not coming back to Gardner again. People still build here. Uh, we we we've approved <laughs> in my three years. We've approved many uh, complexes and developments. Uh, so anyway, I'm I'm fine the way it reads. Can you bring up the cottage? Can I just say something? I I agree mm -hmm. as well. I mean, don't let, I understand what developers say needs to be taken into account, but don't let them dictate how we want our community to look. Um, I'm, it says Liberty doesn't have front facing at all, and I'm sure developers go there and build duplexes. 
So, I mean, if they want to make it work, they'll make it work. Some people have. Exactly. So, and, and how do we answer those developers who have made changes and met our code and said, oh, we're changing again. Sorry, you made all these changes really for no reason. I, I would have problems staring them in the eyes and say, sorry. Do the suggest the proposed changes, the ones you haven't read, would those meet most of the complaints you have or are those still not aggressive enough? Because if they're not aggressive enough, I, I mean, I don't even know why we would change them. Right. I well, there, I, I, don't, I don't know. So we've been playing whack-a-mole here. You, we'll, we'll, we'll fix it and then something else is going to pop up and, and I, I don't want to play whack-a-mole. <laughs> I have to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> it's recorded. Quotable quote. What, um, and not to jump in front of your question, but did you find it? What uh, it have we had any duplex developments comply with our new code? So the I asked Michelle to pull up the uh, plan development for cottages at University Park. That's just you, you all went through all that whole mm -hmm. approval process for them, and there was only a few of those units right. that had to have adjustments because of. Uh, needing to 